uh, thrilled to, uh, this is usually the time of year that we have our annual uh, house lectureship and visiting professorship. This is a, a longtime tradition in our department and in the Division of Plastic Surgery. Dr. House was one of the first plastic surgeons in Sacramento and uh, served this community in a wide variety of uh, ways, and particularly when the medical school uh, got started now, uh, actually 50 years ago, we'll be launching the official celebration of their 50th anniversary throughout the year coming up, and it'll be starting officially in September. But uh, his family endowed this professorship uh, on his uh, passing in order to honor his legacy and his contributions to the Sacramento community in plastic surgery. We're uh, privileged to have a distinguished visitor, as always, this year, and I will turn the introduction uh, over to Dr. Uh, Lee Poo. Good morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our 2018 House Lecture Visiting Professor, Dr. Linda G. Phillips. Dr. Phillips is currently the Chief of Plastic Surgery at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. She's also the Truman G. Blocker, MD, Distinguished Professor at the University of Texas Medical Branch. Dr. Phillips received her medical degree from University of Chicago and the complete her general surgery at the University of Chicago and at Northwestern University. She subsequently completed her plastic residency at the University of Chicago and also Wayne State University. Dr. Phillips was the burn director of Wayne State University Detroit Receiving Hospital from 1985 to 88. And since 1988, she was recruited to the University of Texas Medical Branch. Uh, she's been a, a full-time faculty since uh, 1988. Uh, she was promoted from assistant to full professor of plastic surgery. In 1994, she was appointed as the chief of division of plastic surgery at the university and also uh, Truman, the Truman G. Blocker, this MD distinguished professor. She, she was program director of plastic residency uh, from 1994 to 2017 and, and was senior associate dean for faculty affairs at the university uh, from 2005 to 2013, and also vice chair of the Department of Surgery from 2015 to 2016. Dr. Phillip uh, 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 was board certified in general surgery and plastic surgery. Uh, she's been the best doctor in America uh, since 2003, and uh, she received a dis distinguished service awards from Plastic Surgery Foundation, mentor awards from American Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, and honorary awards from American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Dr. Phillips was a world-renowned academic plastic surgeon, and she is a visionary leader in academic plastic surgery and also for women's <laughs> surgeons. She contributed greatly to general plastic surgery, breast surgery, and the body counseling procedures. Dr. Phillips has held many leadership positions. You can see here she's past president of uh, Association of Women Surgeons, past chair of American Board of Plastic Surgery, past president of Plastic Surgery Foundation, past chair of Plastic Residency Review Committee, past chair of Plastic Research Council, past president uh, of uh, American Council of Academic Plastic Surgeons. She's past president of uh, uh, Texas Society of Plastic Surgeons. She's currently the chair of Plastic and Master Facial Surgery Advisory Council for American College of Surgeons. She's also a regent for, uh, for Plastic Surgery of American College of Surgeons. Dr. Phillips held many, many memberships, including American Surgical Association, American Association of Plastic Surgeons, Western Surgical Association, American College of Surgeons, Society of Universe Surgeons, American, uh, American Society of Plastic Surgeons, and also American Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons. In terms of her uh, scientific contribution, uh, she published uh, 107 journal uh, publications, 43 book chapters, uh, 162 invited lectures, and also she, uh, she has presented 84 meeting, meetings. On behalf of, of Department of Surgery, Division of Plastic Surgery, we welcome Dr. Phillips. Uh, she's going to give a lecture on mentoring surgical resident and the faculty. Dr. Phillips. Thank you. Can you all hear me? I'm, I tend to be soft at times. I'm deeply honored to be invited to speak here and to visit with you all today. Thank you very much. 
um, for letting me come and share some thoughts, and I welcome some of your thoughts or questions as well. I would like to thank the House family for making this visit possible and for letting me be a part, if only for a day, of your family here. So mentoring, what is it? Well, I think you have a really good example here. You have a chair who is very well known for mentoring and respected for that. It takes a lot of effort and thought. She is well connected. You are fortunate. Not all departments have somebody who either is connected or cares, and you've got both. And so you should take advantage of those little office visits that she was just talking about, for instance. But what do we need mentoring for? Well, if you think about it, really just about everything we do in our careers, we need some mentoring, whether it's the service part, the clinical part, research, or education. Who is mentor? If you look at the classical Greek iconic mentor dis definition, it's a wise and trusted advisor. Odysseus left his son Telemachus, who you can see was a, a teenager at the time, and we know any of you who are parents who've had teenagers know how much effort that takes. Um, he didn't want to leave him alone during the wars, and so during the Trojan Wars, he left him to his, to, left Telemachus to his friend mentor, who would guide him and take care of him during that time. This is not only a Western tradition, but in fact, as well, is well known in the Eastern traditions with Arjuna and Drona. So we recognize throughout the world that we need to have mentors. But, you know, in this age when Google trumps our MD and when we can get information very quickly, why do we need a mentor? Why does a medical student, a resident, a faculty member need a mentor? Well, because we all make mistakes, because we don't have all the information, and Google doesn't have all the information either. You need the nuances that a mentor can give you and the connections that a mentor can give you. I was just telling one of my about-to-be fellows um, graduating from our residency that despite what she thinks about going out, because she's a Mormon, she doesn't drink, she has to go and connect, because that's what meetings are about. It's about connections. And connections, as we were just lectured at the American College of Surgeons, is what makes each of us even more effective than what our CV gives us. So it helps you to reduce your mistakes, and you can learn from somebody else who invented the wheel already. You don't have to reinvent it. Your institution benefits if you have one or more mentors. You're more productive because you're not repeating those mistakes. You are recruited often because you know you're going to work for somebody you respect, like, and is connected. And you're retained because of those relationships. That reduces the cost, particularly as we go up the ladder, mid-career and senior faculty. Those recruiting packages are very costly in terms of the time it takes, the resources that must be mustered to bring that person in. Flexibility is endowed with mentorship because you acquire new skills, new friends, new connections. And then there's diversity, and I'll come back to that. But that's going to be the future of surgery in general. What is the value? Well, it's definitely the right thing to do. When you mentor somebody, when you help somebody, you feel good about it. You don't have to be an Eagle Scout to have that good feeling about it. It's also the smart thing to do. I was talking about cost. It helps morale. It helps cut down the cost. We all worry, and yes, mentoring and developing faculty especially is expensive, but it's much cheaper than recruiting new faculty and starting the whole process over again. So when we have a mentor, what do we want? We want somebody who's at least more established than we are, who's accessible, because having a good mentor with a closed door 
doesn't do you any good, or who doesn't answer their emails doesn't do you any good. We want somebody who themselves is independent and not relying upon others, because the farther they are along in the food chain, the more time they have to help you, the less time they're involved with trying to climb the ladder themselves. And you want somebody who connects with you well enough to advocate for you, to bring your name up for panels, papers, promotions, membership. And there's more to it than that. You want somebody who you can emulate. It's not just a role model, though because they have to be accessible to you for information. Somebody who allows others to have the spotlight and is comfortable in that doesn't have to be always the author on every paper that you put out, doesn't have to be on every panel or elected to every office anymore. Somebody who's straightforward and will tell you when you did a good job and when you didn't do quite such a good job. Somebody who's an insider and can lead you down that path who's fairly transparent, tells it like it is, open to other ideas, not just their own, because that only gives you their biases, and you want to know really what's out there. Somebody who's empathic and remembers that, yes, juggling all of those plates can be very difficult, but it is going to be encouraging of you to do this. Somebody who continues to learn, and somebody who's willing to admit their mistakes. So if you find that perfect person, it's a good one to hook on to, to become a mentor. There are multiple mentoring schemes. Paige Moran, who is the past director of the ELAM development program out of Drexel, talks about unilateral versus bilateral. So in the iconoclastic mentor Telemachus, it was all unilateral, from mentor to Telemachus. Many times, though, it's bilateral. And even when I was in the dean's office, my secretary was really good at being a bilateral type of mentor because surgeon speak and dean speak are very different. And surgeons tend to be a little bit more abrupt or rough, and deans like to think of themselves as being smoother. And so I would say something, and my poor secretary would cross her eyes or roll them, and I would know that I needed to soften things a little bit. And so you can have help. When I um, shared an office as my first job as assistant professor, we would close the door periodically and talk about our chief and about our university and exchange ideas and, and thoughts. And that was a bilateral mentoring. You can have one mentor but it's rare that one mentor can help you for everything. And so multiple mentors are often helpful, and this one might help you in your research, and that one in your surgical discipline. Assigned mentors can help, but they're not as strong as chosen mentors. Either one can grow into a very strong relationship, however. And some departments of surgery, such as, or uh, medicine, such as uh, John Stobo led back at Harvard in the 90s, had assigned mentors. And it did increase the amount of mentorship in the department, but everyone who contributed to that project recognized that it wasn't as strong as it might have been if they'd had chosen ones. There's a kind of continuum. Um, from the iconoclastic mentor through a sponsor patron who isn't really invested in you, a guide such as my secretary, and a peer pal such as my co-faculty member. And so that paternalistic godfather is the most powerful, the most lasting, and typically is not an assigned role. You want to partition your mem mentorship needs because there, no one person is going to be strong in everything, um, but it's sort of like a Venn diagram in that there's a lot of overlap between the areas and one person may be able to help you in others. And please don't forget the personal side. One of the most um, impactful mentorships I had was when I was pregnant with my first child and I was a fourth year resident and the cardiac fellow who had gone through the program was telling me about nannies versus daycare and, and just taking care of that part of me. And she couldn't help me in my other 
activities, but she was a tremendous help in this. Don't ignore that side of yourself. Multiple mentors thus can give you a mix of the models and it makes it stronger and more individualized for you yourself. Your sponsor patron, even if they're assigned, can grow into a very strong relationship. But in the short term, what are your goals? Set your priorities, you know, getting how many papers written this year, how many RVUs, how many cl new clinic patients, help you troubleshoot to fix an abstract or a paper that didn't get accepted, network, introduce you at the coffee hour so that you meet people outside your institution, suggest skills acquisitions, symposia, courses that you can take to sharpen or acquire new skills, and critique both positive and negative. Long term, they help you develop your professional profile. What are you known for? What is your research area? What is your clinical area? What do you lecture on? What do you go for panels with? Long term, it helps you with an educational program for yourself, not only for the near, but for the far term to help you with flexibility as you change yourself as you go through your career. And publicity. I can't be on the panel but I have this chief resident, I have this junior faculty member who will do a great job for you, who will do a better job because you want to know about big data and that's not my data set. That just happened to my son who's a postdoc in sociology. He was all blown away that his chair wanted him to sit on this panel. It's like, well, one, he doesn't even understand the coding that you do, and two, that means he's a good mentor. You're in a good position is what I told him. What is the role of the mentee? You should identify your needs with the assistance of both your chair, who has to be a part of this if they're not your direct mentor, and with your mentor, and listen to them as well, because sometimes they're going to give you some messages that you may not enjoy hearing, but you may need to, to be more successful. So you want to communicate bilaterally, and you will acquire education along the way, hopefully. We all should be lifelong learners, right? The mentor needs to communicate and listen as well. We can't have every mentee as a stamped out look-alike of ourselves. They're going to have different hopes and aspirations and skill sets. Some that they're better at, some that they're not as good at as we are as the mentor. We are meant to encourage, being a cheerleader is I think part of um, a good background for being a, men a good mentor as well. And then you may require education to learn to be a good mentor or to find out what they're talking about. Um, so when you're trying to communicate and they ask you, this is several years ago, do you know how to text? Um, if you don't, you probably need to learn Twitter or texting to communicate better. So how do you choose your mentor? Much of it is serendipity, sometimes it's assignment, and sometimes it's a role model. But a role model, we tend to think of as people who are set up on a pedestal, and what you really want is somebody who's approachable, who you can talk to, call, text, even at weird hours. So, how do you find somebody like that? My, my residents are really smarter than that. We're an education program, we're not a training program. Uh, the ask. Well, you don't come into somebody's office and go, will you be my mentor? But you can ask, would you look at this paper? I'm, it, it got rejected from annals, and I need some help with it. Uh, I need to make some corrections. Can you help me design my uh, study for whatever clinical project you want to do? Um, can you tell me how, what I need to do to get to be a board examiner? What are the steps? Those are the kinds of questions you can start out with. If you make a good connection, then you come back the next time with another question and another question, and you develop your relationship that way. Um, remember that, especially for surgeons, asking for assistance is very difficult. We like to think of ourselves as being completely in charge. And although we are moving toward more and more of a team effort, for any one of us, it really takes a village to support us. Um, so asking for assistance, get over that, just go and ask. Remember when you ask for assistance, it's an absolute honor and it's very hard 
for anybody to say no to somebody who's asking for help. So just be happy to go ahead and do that. Look at your goals. Make sure that, particularly in research, that your goals are synergistic. And if not, that you come to some kind of happy medium or get somebody else to help because you don't want to spin your wheels in a laboratory doing somebody else's project if you're really not invested or not well connected to do that. Your mentor can help for the research funding, for working out your models, for the, what a particular grant organization is looking for and how to style your grant or tweak your ideas to make it more attractive to a particular group. Um, define your long-term goals, agree with who's going to be the co-investigator, who, and then working towards independence. You can't make it to being an associate professor if your same mentor is on every single paper because you have to demonstrate your own independence and your mentor has to agree to that. Some mentors have some trouble with that and I'll go more into that later. You need to have flexibility and less and less commitment on the part of the mentor as you go on. You can extend your investigations. Work with your community surgeons, particularly if you're working on a project. So we've got one where we're looking at my more typical academic institution, uh, higher BMI patients for breast reduction, and his more typical out-of-pocket lower BMI breast reduction patients and how they're comparing for this particular study. It's making it a much stronger study. So look beyond your own office, your own institution. Look beyond your own institution for multi-institutional. Those are very powerful. Um, and certainly the VTE study that is um, and has been done in plastic surgery has been very helpful to us. So take it out of the ivory tower. Look everywhere you can to think of your research projects. And make research part of your everyday plastic surgery. Uh, plastic surgeons are known for never doing the same thing twice, which makes clinical research a little bit difficult. But think about what you're doing. And when you tweak your project, when you tweak what you're doing with a patient, whether it's your medical management, your evaluation, your outcomes, Think about studying that. If it's new, then it's worth writing about. And so think about that every day. In your clinical care, some of us need to be proctored a little bit in how we talk to patients. Some of us need to um, get our cases collected with a good variety of cases. And that's your first project, to get board certified when you get out. Multidisciplinary teams. It's increasingly important to work well in teams and to respect all the members. And again, some of us need to work on our interpersonal skills because that's a little different from what particularly the more senior people were taught and educated as we became surgeons. Um, as you are a member of these teams, you will have a specific area that you can devote to the team and add to it. Think about what that is and continue to develop it because that will be your strength, what you talk about in the future, what you write about in the future. A mentor can help promote your clinical activities, whether it's suggesting um, advertising, connections, so um, if you're part of a team, other members in your university who are working on an oncologic area um, who maybe would help you with the physical therapy, the occupational therapy, connecting you that way. The mentor can, who knows the field, can help you with that. And a mentor should work cheek to jowl with the residents, with the faculty, and be in the trenches with them as much as possible, being accessible, not just in the office, in the operating room, in the clinic as well, going through the ORs, talking to the faculty when you're between your cases, dropping in the clinic um, when you're walking through. And that can help you connect to other educational venues. For instance, if you work in clinical education, you have the opportunity to work both with residents and with students. 
And typically, people tend to track themselves either into resident education or student education. And that's true of all disciplines of medicine. So find out what part is needed in your institution, what part you're good at, and build on that, whether it's simulation learning, whether it's working on projects with them, but then continue to follow that. And that will develop into some papers or some opportunities to speak at different venues for you. Global health is another source of mentorship, and that's increasingly important to our millennial incoming students and residents. And making those connections, whether it's through organizations or through the mentor's own ties, can be very helpful. So if this is something that the faculty member or the resident wants to do, they should connect. And there are many people out there. Um, Operation Giving Back from the American College of Surgeons, um, VIPS from plastic surgery are just two minor examples. There are community-based, faith-based organizations that we as well that you may be able to connect with through your own community. And that can give you global health opportunities that will expand what you do, it lets you be a mentor because of the care that you're giving or the teaching that you're doing to the people who are your peers in other countries. And it will allow you, again, more opportunities for papers and presentations in the future. Institutional leadership, developing contacts within your department and outside of the department. A mentor can tell you that a particular committee, like at our place, it would be the admissions committee, is a huge amount of work and isn't something that a first, second, third year new faculty member should take on. It's something that maybe you want to do a little bit later. And they can direct you to things to get into committee work. Committee work is important. It helps you develop your leadership skills. It makes you a member of the institution a contributing member of the institution. And it gives you connections outside of your department, outside of your di discipline, which are important for you. And so then you can continue to build on that, um, perhaps sitting on the faculty senate, um, perhaps working, as I said, on hospital or institutional committees. National leadership, finding somebody who's been ahead of you who can tell you how to get on committees. It's changed in, in my own discipline. It used to be that you'd write a letter for somebody, you'd make a phone call. Now the individual gets online and says, I want to be on these committees. These are my strengths. But the phone call still doesn't hurt. And the phone call is still good for the incoming president who will then appoint the committee members. And then, of course, showing up, which is probably 90% of <laughs> being successful and doing the work on the committees, participating in that. Eventually, you become a committee chair, maybe chairs of a couple things. You start coming to the board meetings. Um, you start then being nominated. Let people know. I can't tell you how many times somebody was disappointed and was told, oh, I didn't know that you were interested in that leadership position. You don't have to hide it. You don't have to be the most aggressive, and, and you know campaigning isn't going to do it. But do let people know your aspirations. Do let people know that you want to get along in your national organizations, and that will really help to promote you and your cause. And don't forget, just in plastic surgery, everything is a little bit different. And for, between plastic and surgery and urology and orthopedics, each organization is a little bit different. The senior club, old boys club, getting into that is going to be very different from becoming a member of the Orthopedic Academy um, or the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, where as long as you've got a license and nobody has um, called you in yet, uh, you're likely to be, become a member once you're board certified. In the old boys club, you have to be nominated to uh, letters of support. It's a two-year process and went before you finally get into the American Association. So it's different in each one. Know what the rules are before you try 
it's a waste of time to do it otherwise. So, you residents, how do you get a faculty position? Well, do ask your mentor. Um, we do talk about what positions are open. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a meeting and said, I'm looking for a hand surgeon. Do you have a good fellow coming out? I'm looking for a hand surgeon. Do you know somebody who is mobile? Um, so even mid-career, you can make those changes by listening to the ground chatter, if you will, and um, connect using your connections for this. Um, obviously, the better job you do day to day as a resident or as a fellow, the better the re recommendation you're going to get. So don't, don't forget the every day in looking toward your future. The more presentations, the more publications you do, the better. Presentations at the podium as opposed to posters are far better because people see you. When they're in the coffee afterward, um, they may not remember your name, but they'll remember your face and they'll remember that you present so they know you're already getting tuned in and you're working hard. So it is helpful in many ways. And the mentor's support is invaluable. APT, that's what <coughs> academicians live and die on. It's how you are promoted or how you're cut from your program. The terrain is particular to each division, department, and school. In our school, we have the bar, but certain departments have raised the bar and have a higher requirement for each of the promotions. And so you need to know what that is. And the time to find out is not when the clock has you at two years before your tenure is up. Every place has a tenure clock. If, you don't, if you're on the tenure track and you don't make tenure within that time, you're either cut or in some places like ours, you can switch from the tenure to the non-tenure track. Know what the requirements are before you sign your contract so that you know what you have to do and no, so no bad surprises come along. Um, these aren't always transparent, so you have to ask. And they're not forgiving. They are pretty rigid. And when you're put up for promotion, it usually goes to a committee of multidisciplines, many of whom don't know you. If they're in your department, they're usually not allowed in the room during the discussion about you. So it's got to be what's on your paper. And if you're a member who's not exactly like everybody else due to your ethnicity, your race, your gender, you may be a little bit different and you may have a lot of calls. One of my faculty members was constantly being called and interrupted um, in a way uh, because he was an absolute wonderful mentor and he was a great way to recruit other African American faculty to the institution, but it was a lot of dinners and a lot of time with people, but it did pay off for others. So the clock. Promotion, there's a clock in many institutions for time to the next promotion. Find out if that's true and what your clock is. Find out about the tenure clock. An organizational clock. Some of our organizations don't allow you to hold office if you're over a certain age. So our uh, research council, if you're over 50, uh, you can't be an officer. Um, it used to be 45, but now with the expansion of residency and fellowship, it's been longer. Then there's the biologic clock. And if you're planning a family, your biologic clock has been ticking before you entered medical school. For surgeons, for women, exposed to the OR environment, fertility rates begin to decline at a rate of three years earlier than the general population. Uh, we don't know why, but that's true. So you can't put it off too long. And offline, I'll tell you about one of my first editorials about trying to support um, the next generation and the uh, DNA of people who enter into surgical residencies. It's a long, too long a story for this. Um, you can get your life balance. Some days the plates don't stay in the air. Some days you can juggle them very well. You need a really good support. The first is your partner. Whatever kind, I'm from a traditional family, but whatever kind of partnership you have, that person has to be as committed to your family and your relationship as you are. 
or it, it's going to be a very long slide for you. Outsource. My husband thinks he can paint, but he doesn't have the time. It took years to get our house painted before he finally caved and let me call somebody. Similarly, I don't like takeout. I cook far better, I think, than most takeout, but it might be 10 o'clock at night before we get to eat. Forget it. Takeout is the thing that we do. Um, and we had nannies until my youngest child was 16 and a half, and she said, I can drive. I'll do the errands that the nanny does, but all my, kid, all my friends are laughing at me for having a nanny at 16 and a half. Um, flexibility. There are multiple paths. When I recruited a microsurgeon, she wanted to do all of our breast reconstruction. I'd been doing all the breast reconstruction. It was a make or break. She got the breast reconstruction. But we had become a Medicare certified bariatric surgery center. And there are all these people with skin hanging down to their knees and they needed somebody. So I became a body contouring after massive weight loss. And those are the really sick patients that that allowed me to still take care of sick patients as well. And so I do a lot of body contouring now, as well as I'm known for making probably the prettiest pressure sore reconstruction that you can see. Um, respond to change in your environment and reinvent yourself, and it'll be a longer career. Remember, some academicians are our own enemy, and we must make sure that we're not an enemy to the upcoming generation, give back. I can barely give back anything except the occasional, I'm the president, so I can make sure that somebody who's been kind and caring, not just to me, but to others in our field, gets the award for mentoring. That's giving back. Giving forward is what you do for the people behind you. And even you medical students, if you're helping out a first year who thinks they want to go into surgery, you're mentoring, whether you call it that or not. Continue to do that. You have no idea of the impact that you're making, but you're making a huge impact, and you're giving somebody the encouragement to go into the field that you love. Women and minorities often feel isolated. Surgery can be a very isolating um, discipline. Um, we're often alone on call with our critical decisions, um, leading in the operating room. We have slightly different needs, whether it's childbearing, whether it's making connections, um, networking in one way or another. The mentor that you choose should be sensitive to this. My program director is my lifelong mentor, but he told me early on I needed to connect with a group of women surgeons who could support me through my multiple pregnancies and taking care of my children. Um, I had one friend who called me in tears when her five-year-old twins, who were bigger than every other kid in that class, got kicked out for bullying in preschool, and we walked each other through it. I mean, those are the connections you need. When they're five-year-olds and they're kicked out of their preschool, you're sure that you are raising a juvenile delinquent, and these kids will never get anywhere. And I can't tell you how many times I would come home and I would hear something, and it's like, what were you thinking? No, were you thinking when you did that? You know, you can talk to your kids a little differently than you talk to your faculty and residents, especially now. Um, so this zebra is wondering what she's doing in the paddock with all of these full-bred horses. Um, but if there's a little mixture of the DNA, they'll be far stronger. We all know that some of the best dogs are crossbreeds, mixed breeds. And the more diversity that we have by bringing people in who don't look exactly like us, who don't think exactly like us, who don't even talk exactly like us, but have better skills in other areas, that will make us a stronger program, division, department, institution. So pay attention to your benchmarks, whatever they are, in clinical, in research, in your education, in your service, particular to your role or your national activities, your milestones of promotion and tenure in your academic career. And don't forget to invest in our future. No matter what it looks like or sounds like, 
our diversity is going to be our key. Try not to be a toxic mentor and don't hook on to a toxic mentor. And if you figure out your mentor is starting to hurt you more than help you because they always want to be on your paper and the APT committee just said you're not independent because they're always on your paper, then you need to start to cut the cord and move on if necessary. In concluding, um, seek out the mentors who are like you and can help you and who you want to be like when you grow up. Not that any of us ever really grow up. So why do you do it as a mentor? Because as a clinician, you take care of an individual. As a teacher, you can impact many more patients. A researcher finds better ways to treat patients. An administrator helps to shape and give back to the specialty as a whole. But as a mentor, in each of these areas, your efforts are geometrically increased. And so, yes, I think it's worthwhile. Thank you. I really am honored to be here today. Thank you. so much for uh, coming to speak with us about things that affect each of us at different levels. We um, are really thrilled to have you here. We have a minute or two to take some questions um, from the audience if there are any burning questions about how mentorship can influence your life. I enjoyed the uh, lecture very much. Uh, Lectures like this are always colored by the very special people uh, in your life. Uh, were they in elementary school, high school, medical school, residency, beyond, or uh, uh, the continuum that you suggested? For most of us, I think there are uh, only a few people who uh, truly did make a difference. And uh, I'm sure you've reflected on uh, your impact on your career and your life. I have to give credit to my parents first. Um, my dad always said, do your best, and my mom said, be true to yourself. Those, those are good mantras still. Um, my fifth grade teacher who slapped the report card straight A's, and I was a nerd, um, but said, now you know what this means. And my parents said, college. And she said, no, no, she needs to keep going. So that pushed and kind of made me think about more than just ending in college. My program director, Marty Robson, um, is not always the easiest person to get along, and he will admit that. Um, but he has been fabulous and giving to me, and a great critic and supporter, always. Um, and then I've had multiple mentors once I got out as well. I've been fortunate. I think that's a good thing to take a catalog for all of us. And you know, people talk about your, your gratitude journal, your just gratitude journal. I think taking a minute to uh, be grateful for all of those mentors who have contributed is great. Thank you so much. We have a small token of appreciation we want to share with you. Thank you. Oh, that's beautiful. So, on behalf Thank of the Department of Surgery, this is a clock for you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you.